Hello everyone, this is a video to diagram the disappearance of Jason Jolkowski. Um, this is, I think, believe the second episode Unfound ever did. His mother Kelly was my guest, and we talked about his disappearance. And I have to admit that I do not like to put um, superlatives on disappearances, we, uh, superlative, superlatives like you do in high school for senior, uh, class clown, most likely to succeed, or those are what superlatives are. Um, but I have to say this has to be one of um, Unfound's most befuddling uh, cases that, that we've covered. I, I think I can admit that. So what you're looking at here is... Up here, let me see if I can use my pencil again. Sure, I can. This is uh, approximately where Jason and his family were living at the time, near the intersection of this is Bedford Avenue right here, and this is 48th Street going up and down, and once again, Bedford going east and west. And they lived right here in this area. You can see that this is where he was approximately living. And this is the school down here on the bottom left-hand side where he was to meet uh, a co-worker who was picking him up and they would go to work together. I'm not sure exactly where. I think it was a female co-worker. I'm not sure where she was parked. This looks like a pretty big campus here, but yeah, this is the approximate area. And you can see here that the walking time, and that's what Jason was doing uh, that day, 14 minutes, and it says there, 0.6 miles, so just over a half mile. Not far at all. In fact, um, given where I live, uh, that I can look out uh, the on the elevator landing, looking east from where I live, and you can easily see over a half mile. It's not far <clears throat> at all. So he wasn't walking that far, and still something happened between here and here. Um, what I think is noteworthy is that uh, a neighbor uh, saw him taking the trash can back into his house at approximately 10.45 a.m., and that was the last time that we know of anybody who saw him, anybody that's been tracked down all these years, almost um, 20 years later. And I think that makes sense because 1045, it's, if it's a 14-minute walk, it would make sense then that maybe they were scheduled to meet here at 11 o'clock. So he takes in the trash at 1045, roughly 15 minutes later, he's there at the school at 11 o'clock right on time. They go to work. I think this also makes sense is because if you look at reports, and we talked about this in the episode as well, when he didn't show up, at some time between 11.15 and 11.30, uh, this co-worker went to the, the closest place she could find to find a payphone to call, I think it was her work, to say that Jason never showed up. It, it is my belief that she didn't have his home phone number. 2001, some people had cell phones, but it does not sound like this co-worker had one, and I don't think that Jason had one either. So she had to rely on the old-fashioned technology, go drive somewhere, find a payphone, or maybe just maybe if it was a gas station or something, they just let him use a regular phone to call work and say, hey, I might be late. Jason hasn't showed up. Can you call? And, of course, nobody answered when uh, a phone call was made to the Jolkowski home. And that's how this disappearance got started. Somewhere between here and here, somewhere in here, something happened. Now, I'm not going to get into it here, but I have my own ideas about what happened. Uh, my best guess, uh, I've written about it in the first Unfound book, if you'd like to get that on Amazon in either print or ebook form. Um, well, the reason I call this uh, disappearance befuddling is because we talk a lot about people who have walked away 
people who are walking places and didn't get there. But usually these people, to be frank, sometimes, you know, they're in a, in a, in a bad relationship. Maybe it's a woman walking somewhere and we believe maybe her husband or boyfriend did something to her. It makes total sense. Some of these people are into drugs, into criminal activity. And so maybe it makes more sense that something bad happened along the way. Whereas Jason, of course, wasn't into any of that. He was 19 years old, living at home, living a, a good life, um, making good choices, his education, and everything else. And somewhere in here, uh, he disappeared. I will say this. I do believe that somebody he knew picked him up, somebody who he trusted. I, I've had a chance to think about this a lot. I've talked to some of my assistants about it. And no matter how many times I try to look at it from a different point of view, I keep coming back to the idea that somebody he trusted happened upon him while he was walking from point A to point B, and this person convinced him to get in the car. Maybe Jason said something like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to meet my a co-worker over at the high school and this person said, hey, don't worry about that. Get in with me. I'll take you to work. This makes a lot of sense uh, because what doesn't make sense is given that Jason was 19 years old, he was a bigger kid, over six feet tall, Not would not have been the type of person that uh, a criminal would pick out to a mug or abduct or anything like that. Uh, I think that it was somebody that Jason trusted. We have to remember that he did have some uh, learning disability. And his mother ex explained that maybe he was too uh, trusting of people. That could have played a part in, in what happened here. But I've convinced myself that it was somebody who knew Jason that just happened upon him that day. And uh, picked him up and something happened. You can go with where with you can go wherever you, wherever you want with that particular comment, but that's all I really want to say in this video. Now, something I want to add on to this, and I mentioned this in the update episode, is that we are looking at uh, getting paperwork on a disappearance that happened a month later. Although I do not believe it happened in the area of where Jason disappeared, where this young man was living uh, was in was was in the area of where Jason and his family was living. And he and this guy, uh, young man Sam Sherman, disappeared in July of 2001. Jason disappeared in June of 2001. Sam Sherman lived down this direction somewhere. A little farther away from where this, let me maybe we just um, uh, move this over a little bit. There we go. But, you know, once again, here's the school. Here's where Jason lived. Um, on Bedford Avenue, somewhere over this direction to the east. Farther away from the school, but surely in the same general area of where Jason lived. Now, as much as we can get so far regarding Sam Sherman's disappearance is that he allegedly went for a, a job interview that day and disappeared. Either he didn't show up for the interview or he disappeared after the interview. But right now we're trying to find file a FOIA with the Omaha Police Department to get any paperwork we can on, can on Sam Sherman's disappearance, even if it's just finding out who was the person who reported him missing. I think that would help us a lot because, to be honest, you try to do some database searches for a Sam Sherman who lived in Omaha, Nebraska, there are none. So, we're just not sure. And we're hoping that that paperwork can shed some light on who he is, who filed the police report, and we're going to try to track down some of his family, friends, or anybody else. Hopefully, we can get that done. But once again... This is where Jason lived. This is where he was going. He disappeared somewhere in this area. And Sam Sherman was living in a house down this way, although I'm not exactly sure what house it was, but I have read that he was living in a house over here, this direction, uh, on Bedford Avenue. 
So there you go. That is a diagram of the disappearance of Jason Jolkowski, along with a little bit of explanation of what we're working on regarding the disappearance of Sam Sherman, who lived in the same area of Jason and disappeared a month later.